Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Palma and I am a Director of Graduate Admissions at Bay Path University. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we are waiting for a few more people to be logging on. I see um, some logging on as we speak. So uh, we will be starting this presentation in about one more minute. Thanks for your patience um, and we look forward um, to offering you this exciting presentation today. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Palma and as I said, I am a Director of Graduate Admissions here at Bay Path University. And I am pleased to welcome you to our Hot Topics webinar today. Thanks so much for joining us from wherever you may be across the country and perhaps internationally. Um, we are, are going to be presenting um, Making Student Success a Shared Responsibility. And our guest today is Gary Fretwell, who is a Senior Vice President at Ruffalo Noel Levitz, also um, called RNL. Before I turn the presentation over or introduce you to Gary, I'd just like to take a few moments to orient you to our online environment. You should see an empty questions box where you can type in questions, click send, and then we will be able to read these and respond to all of you at the end of the webinar. But go ahead and type those questions in as we go. Um, if you're thinking of things so you don't forget them and then we will be sure to read them aloud and respond to them at the end of the presentation. So um, for any of you who may not be familiar with BayPath, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background. We were actually established in 1897, and we have a very long history of providing educational opportunities for both women and men throughout the United States and also internationally, um, offering both on-campus programs and online programs um, uh, in the New England region. Uh, we are also fully accredited by the New England Commission of Higher Education. And uh, BayPath is a leader in uh, providing a wide array of degrees that are focused on some of the most emergent careers, such as higher education, genetic counseling, clinical mental health counseling, leadership and negotiation, cybersecurity, and many more. We have over 30 graduate programs and certificates, many available evenings and online. Um, most of our online programs have uh, no residency requirement. And we also offer career advising from admissions counselors and faculty, um, all of this to uh, give our students the best possible experience here, both academically and personally. Um, we offer our students a lot of personalized attention throughout the process and our faculty are trained in teaching online and supporting our students um, in to encourage them to succeed both academically and through their careers. So today we are very pleased to welcome Gary Fretwell 
As I said, um, Gary is a senior vice president at Ruffalo Noevitz. He has a 45 career, a 45 year career, excuse me, very impressive in higher education. And um, the second bullet point is one I really like. He's been a strong catalyst for enrollment success on many campuses throughout North America. So uh, catalyst for enrollment success, um, that's a great, a great bullet point. And you can see here on the slide just a couple things about Gary. He's worked with um, more than a thousand campuses um, at the University of North Carolina. He helped the campus increase student enrollment by a whopping 25% in just one year. And he's also a nationally known uh, presenter on a various wide array of topics. Uh, and today he's going to be focusing on um, student success and retention. And so we're thrilled and delighted to welcome Gary um, to our presentation today. Uh, uh, Jennifer, thank you for, for that introduction. Every time I see that, it makes me tired though, to be honest with you, but I, I appreciate the introduction. And I wanna thank everyone who is participating in this presentation. And uh, I thought it might be helpful to describe very quickly uh, what we want to Cover, but I'd like to start with the reason uh, I think this this presentation and this particular topic is so important, and it goes back even to the title, making student success a shared responsibility. One thing that I've found in working with a lot of institutions and looking at enrollment management in, in a in a wide array of areas, um, oftentimes people when they think about enrollment management, they think about uh, efforts. Um, they almost want to take student success or retention, however you characterize it, and put it off to the side and say, oh, I thought we were going to talk about enrollment management instead of student success or retention. And, and now we're talking about student success and retention. I would say to you, just from my experience, that um, if you want to make the greatest difference in your enrollment on your campus, it is it just it's not only important it is vital that you focus on are students actually successful on your campus one number two that it is a sense of shared responsibility on campus um, so in order to cover that in the time we have and we have about 30 minutes or so um, I'd like to talk about three things and then have a chance for discussion and questions and, and however I can be of assistance to you one, I'd like to start with uh, talking about, uh, actually a little bit about the context of why I think it's so important uh, in other ways, but I want to talk to you about defining student success at your campus. Um, a lot of times I find that people have a, a quite limited view of what student success is, and part of our job in this process, is especially if we want to get people to share in it with us, um, we need to ensure that there is a clarity around what we're trying to do. And so I'll talk about a little bit about how to do that. Number two, I believe there are certain principles and elements that are just absolutely necessary in order to have successful uh, retention programs on your campus in order to impact students. And impact is really what we're trying to do is impact and have certain outcomes take place and I think there's things that you can do to make that happen. And number three, I, I'm gonna give you a suggestion about something um, uh, very specifically and dive into just one piece of this uh, around developing your retention plan. And I'll share with you what I have found on many campuses to be true. And I want to talk to you about retention plan as a, a basically as a catalyst for bringing people together and to moving the needle in terms of your uh, student success on your campus. And then we'll leave some time for discussion. Jennifer, why don't we go to the next slide? Jennifer, uh, there you go, thank you. Um, one of the things that has been clear to me as institutions embark on looking at uh, their retention programs, two things happen. Um, uh, one is there's usually an increase in enrollment and two the quality of the programs and at least the perception of quality of the programs on campus increase for students and I see this in countless ways a lot of times when people think about increasing enrollment they think about it from an admission standpoint you know we need to bring in more new students we need to uh, bring in more uh, maybe freshmen or transfer graduate students 
And they think of improving their enrollment situation primarily by increasing the number of students that attend, that, that come into the institution. But I will say to you, what I have found over many years of experience is that for most campuses, improving retention and student success all the way through from persistence all the way through to graduation has more impact, more impact than almost anything else you can do to improve your enrollment situation. So I'm a big advocate for it. And secondly, is as we do that, the quality of the experience for the students increases. Now, Jennifer, let's go to the next slide. If, and, and many of you have probably seen this data that is collected by ACT, but it, it affects both ACT and SAT. Um, institutions are broken down in terms of their study of retention and graduation rates by uh, a couple of ways. One is how selective the school is. And one of the things I always encourage people to do, and um, I would love to, if, if we were together, I would love to ask you, you know, where do you fall in your institution? Where do you fall in terms of selectivity of the students that come into your institution? If you look at that middle 50%, where would you fall? And you'll see some of these will sort of fall in between one or two of the uh, indicators between liberal or traditional or traditional and selective. So find yourself in that and and that would be number one. Find yourself in that and where you fall. Now let's go to the next slide. If we take that and we look at retention rates for both public and private, and we'll do both, we'll look at retention public rates. What I would encourage you to do, I know we have a number of two-year institutions as well as four-year institutions on the, on this call, public and private, one of the things that I encourage you to do is find out sort of where you were in terms of selectivity, and then according to whether your highest degree on campus is an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a PhD, find yourself in this group. And so you you find you say let's say you're a traditional campus, and the highest degree on your campus is a PhD, the typical retention rate, and this would be first time full-time freshmen that come back for the subsequent sophomore year. So you'd have a 74.9. That would sort of be an average. Now, all of us know that we have many students that are coming in that may be transfer students. They may not be coming in in the fall. They may be part-time. They may be full-time. And one of the things I always encourage people to do is even though this gives you a good benchmark what we need to do is isolate all of the major populations you have coming in and start to develop some tracking around that. And I'll show you about that. But this gives you a good benchmark of where you fall next to national average. Jennifer, next slide, please. If we look at it for private institutions, there is some difference in this, but not a lot of difference. And so one of the things that we note in this and we'll find is that the more selective the institution is, Typically, not always, the retention and rate uh, for those first-time, full-time freshmen, the better students, is increased over those that are that are more challenged. It is not always the case, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, understanding retention rate is one thing. Understanding graduation and completion rates is another thing. And one of the pressures I'm finding for a lot of institutions they have made progress to move their retention rates somewhat, but their graduation rates are suffering dramatically. Um, students are not persisting, they're not progressing effectively. And so what is happening for some students, they're running out of federal aid. You know, they are running out of time to use federal aid to support themselves to go to the institution. Or as they advance through the support that often campuses have on first year students, there starts to be less support in the sophomore and even junior years. And so we're seeing real impact on, uh, on the students continuing. Uh, so at the public institutions, and again, pick yourself out where you would fall, and then the private institutions, and you'll see what those retention rates are and graduation rates. I encourage institutions to look at both. I think it's very important that you look at, you look at both of these and know this for camp, your campus. Now, I'll say one more a point about this before we go into defining uh, student success on your campus. 
many institutions that I go to, one of the things I'll do, and I'll go and visit a campus for a day or a day and a half, and then I'll give them feedback about what they can do to improve their enrollment, whether it be uh, admissions or retention or, or, or marketing, whatever. And one of the things I have when I talk about student success is the first thing, the first thing most campuses and most people on campus do not know what these rates are, either retention or graduation rate. So job one is to understand where you sort of fall for these cohorts. Now, again, with a caveat that we understand and we know that there are other ways students come into our institutions that we need to be tracking as well and looking at. So note my recommendation one is know what is true for your campus and two, find out how well that's communicated on campus because people are rarely willing to engage if they don't know or if they're under a false assumptions. So first point, this first thing I'd encourage you to do is define what student success is on your campus. Um, uh, when, uh, if we can go to the uh, next slide, uh, Jennifer. So what, what I often encourage people to do when, if people do have a definition of retention on campus, what I find is that the definition is too limited. Um, if they know a definition, it is typically a definition for that, again, overall freshman cohort that start in the fall to go to the next fall. I will tell you quite honestly, that's not enough. I think that there needs to be more understanding about how students are moving through your campus and how they are engaging or not engaging. Um, it, it, the thing we need to understand that everything that happens on campus does have an impact. It's interesting, when I ask people on campus, uh, who's responsible for retention or student success? Everyone in this call probably knows the same, the answer I get. The answer I get most typically is it's everyone's responsibility. And I, it's a common, a, common, a common line. But as I have visited campuses, and talk with them, one of the things I realized very quickly is that, and I actually made a little poem up, I'm not a poet, but here's my little poem about this. Retention is everyone's responsibility, and I'm sure someone is doing it, but I know it's not me. Because a lot of times people say that, and it sounds good, but they don't know what it really means in terms of how they impact students. Okay, Jennifer, we go to the next slide. So when we look at retention and we start to think about what it's really measuring, it's not just a number that we have to report. It's, it's, it's answering some basic questions. How much growth is taking place for the students? How much learning is taking place? And because ultimately, if students don't feel like they're growing and learning, their motivation to continue wanes very quickly. Number two is students, when we first bring them to the campus, Oftentimes they feel very valued, very respected, but students have told me on countless times when I've interviewed them when on campus, they said to me is that when we were being recruited and when we first came to campus, we felt so valued and respected, so supported, and then it felt like the actually the bottom fell out of that support. Uh, many students have actually described this to me as feeling like they have fallen off a cliff, that they, they're, they're, there's no support under them anymore. And so I think it's really important that we find ways to continue to value students and respect them as it, throughout their life cycle at the institution. And then, and then the third thing is, is, is students come into your, our institutions with certain expectations about what they're going to experience, what they're going to learn, and how they're going to proceed through the, the experience. And one of the things that retention does, it measures is, are we effectively delivering that to students? Are we providing them that kind of quality experience? Jeff, let's go to the next slide. <coughs> so a couple of, of major concepts uh, that I uh, would like to just bring into this question of defining it on campus. 
is number one is to understand retention, how we describe it, and retention is more for a campus, and that's why I often use the term student success, is more than one thing. It's uh, complex and it's multivariate. I'll, I'll share with you a model that I think works in that regard. And number two, if we're able to identify and if we're able to use some tools that are available, we can actually pre predict and even prevent attrition of our students. And the idea here is to think about rather than just saying this many left, how can we identify earlier students that need support, provide that support to them before they've already made the decision to leave? So let's move to the next slide, Jennifer. If we look at this next slide and think about how students sort of move through the process. So we have students enroll in their institutions and then they, they, uh, they move through the cycle and hopefully ultimately graduate and are alumni. And by the way, if they are graduates and alumni, they're typically uh, much better, more likely to support the institution in significant ways. One of the things that I recommend is I recommend thinking about retention or student success in these terms. How are students moving term to term through the institution? How many are successfully progressing through a term to term? How many from fall to fall and how many to graduate? I will tell you one of the things that I am seeing that is more important than probably anything else in this, uh, at least in the campuses I go to, and that would be the issue of progression. And one real quick thing you could do on your campus to find out is progression an issue or not an issue on your campus. Look at your returning students for the second year and ask yourself or look and find out how many of those students are still freshmen in terms of their classification. How many are actually successfully progressing or not? Because of the cost of higher education, because of the challenges of, of moving through it quickly, I'm finding that as students make better progress towards their degree, the likelihood of them being retained and ultimately graduate increases dramatically. So that encourages us to start to think about it, not just in terms of what we do to bring a student in, not even what we do in that first year to get them off to a good start, but to be doing things that actually move them forward in terms of progression. Okay, Jennifer, uh, so define for your campus what student success is, what you're gonna be looking at, what's important, and where you sort of fall now. We wanna benchmark where we are. So number two, successful elements. And I have looked at this and any one of these elements we could spend this entire time on talking about. But what I wanna do is give you some things that I think are very helpful. Now, we have, I have a, um, a, a short survey that I, we will make available to you. Jennifer can make that available to you. Uh, it's 35 good questions to ask. And what that is, is to sort of understand where you currently fall in terms of best practices in terms of student success. One of the things I'd encourage you to do is give that to a group of people on your campus and go through the, the little survey. And what it will do, it will show you, and it, I see it's now available. Um, it will, it, it, is, it is first of all an eye opener to say, okay, here's where we stand now, or here's where people think we stand right now, or they don't even know where we stand right now on that. But it's a wonderful catalyst for discussion and encouragement of saying, these are practices that we probably should have put in place. What can we do to move in that direction? So if we go to, I, I would encourage you to use that on your campus. And by the way, if we had more time and we were together, one of the things I'd be doing is I'd be having you take that right now. And we would be talking about some of the findings that you had very quickly. Jennifer, let's go to the next slide. I think that there are uh, six principles that are uh, just absolutely necessary for uh, retention efforts to be successful. Number one is I think that there needs to be an integration of programs and services. And what I mean by this is this. One of the things I find when I'm on campuses oftentimes is campuses have wonderful programs, incredible services for students, 
But what we find is that a lot of those programs and services are somewhat siloed on campus. And I know that that's a common term to use, but siloed or separate from each other. So the quality of that program is great, but the connection of those programs, and what I characterize it as, is students actually fall between the cracks between one program or one service and another. And so one of the things we're trying to do in this is we're trying to bring those programs and services together. So at least for the student, it is seamless what they experience. Number two is we rely on student feedback. One of the things I think is absolutely critical is, uh, yes, we'll stay on this slide for just a minute, is relying on that feedback from students. People ask me, how do you get that? Well, you can do focus groups. You can do a number of things. I would recommend you look at some of the national surveys on that, build out a practice of getting that feedback from students on a regular basis. If you need more information about that, I'm happy to send that to you or give that to you of the services I think that are available. Number three, provide quality classroom engagement. And by the way, that classroom experience, that experience in the classroom or taking classes is both true for online as well as in the seats. And I think it's very important that we realize that regardless of what we do, if students don't have a quality experience in the classroom, our chances of success are pretty significantly limited. Number four, I encourage you to think about, are we student-centered? And I'm not saying give over the, the keys to the, the buildings to the students, but I'm saying is let's think about are we do are our practices developed and created to support us or are they there to support students? Are we helping students to understand that we are thinking about them and supporting them and re providing them resources they need in an effective way? Number four, empower families and students to develop relationships. Um, people have often asked me well, if I had to characterize in moment management how I'd characterize it, the short, and then they, they typically say the short version, Gary, especially after they've heard me speak. But I always tell them there's, four, there's three things that, it, that impact in moment management. Number one is that you have good access to data to make informed decisions. If you don't have good data, good supportive data, um, you're, run, you're running blind and you really need to have that. Number two, you need to have plans that use that data and information to best utilize the resources you have to most impact the students in a positive way. And number three, you need to think about in everything you do, is it advancing the relationship of the student with the institution or is it creating a barrier? And I'd encourage you to think about that, regardless of whether it's the first time they come to your website or whether they're in an academic advising meeting or if they're sitting in a classroom. Is it advancing the relationship with that student or is it creating a barrier? And then the final thing, and the thing that I get in trouble for, by the way, people don't like to necessarily hear it, but let me, hopefully I can explain it to you. The third, the six principles is be intrusive and intentional. Well, people have a lot of problems with the word intrusive. And what I mean by that is this, is to be able to give students what they need before they even know they need it. How many students are coming to our institutions that really don't have clarity about how to take advantage of our services, how to take advantage of what we have to offer? Oftentimes, we have to be intrusive in the sense of giving them to that before they even know it. And the second thing is we need to be intentional about that. And intentionality brings those things together and links them together. Again, it helps to integrate our services. So intrusive and intentional, six principles. If we did nothing but talk about this, these six principles are key. Jennifer, let's go to the next slide. One of the things that you will see in the 35 good practices and you will see in, uh, in terms of successful retention programs, we think there's certain things you have to have. You have to have good data. You have to be able to identify students early on. You need to front load and provide students with support and then make them more progressively responsible in terms of things. We need to think about the teaching and learning process. We need to think about how to keep students engaged. And you can see all these different characteristics of programs that we see that are effective that oftentimes align with those principles we just talked about. Now, let's go to the next slide, Jennifer, and get a little more concrete on this. 
So there's some things that I think uh, that you should do. And if you really want to have this as a shared responsibility and move the needle on your campus, and you might ask yourself, do we have this or not? You should have strategies identified that improve, and again, all those multivariate measures, persistence, progression, retention, and graduation. You should have specific strategies identified on how to do that. Number two, you need to have a retention committee. And what I mean by that is a really a student success committee that truly is a committee that is active, focused, understands where you are, and, and by quite candidly, I would encourage you to have that committee be the ones that actually create the retention plan for the campus because they will be the most informed. Number three, hire somebody that is responsible for being that catalyst or collaborating across campus. Not the person that's responsible for retention, the person that's a catalyst that keeps us all moving in that direction because it's going to be continual. Number four, is develop a retention plan. Uh, a lot of times people say, well, Gary, do we really need a retention plan? I think it's essential. It will be the catalyst for change if you put that in place. That process of bringing people together starts to help people gain clarity about what it means to move the needle in terms of student success. Jennifer, we'll go to the next slide. I always encourage people um, as, as the fifth thing is to think about your early alert and intervention strategies. Now, quite candidly, there's a lot of tools that people buy and, and, and there's, there's some wonderful ones, by the way, uh, to help us identify and be able to intervene with students. What I find is the difference between what the capability of those early alerts are and the strategies to use them seems to be broken on many campuses. And so one of the things I would say is how advanced is your early alert network and how are you taking that information and using it most effectively? I think you need to understand what are the risk elements. And by the way, those risk elements, many of you could probably recite those right now. Think about risk elements both for populations and for programs. Are there certain risk elements with certain populations you have and or certain programs that you offer that are higher or different? And do you know that so we can intervene? Again, everything's around intervention. And then finally, understand the motivational levels uh, that uh, when students come in. I would recommend there's some great tools to identify uh, motivation, to identify what uh, a student is and, and where they are in that process as they come into the institution because that lack of motivation can have significant impacts on the number of courses they take, the progress they make, and ultimately whether they're stay at your institution. One final thing in terms of principles on the next slide, Jennifer, please. There are, if you want to emphasize anything, I'm going to give you three things that I would recommend uh, uh, thinking about very, very uh, deliberately. Number one, what level of learning is taking place on campus? How do you measure that? How do you know what that is? How are we, how are we looking to improve that? Number two, the process that students experience in the classroom is absolutely essential. That is their connection with the institution in a very, very tangible way. And number three, which may or may not surprise you, is advising. We have looked at advising now for, we have an instrument called the Student Satisfaction Inventory. We um, actually um, do uh, provide that survey to approximately a million students a year. There's one truism in all the years we've had that. The number one thing from the standpoint of the students over those 35 years is advising. Students view advising as that roadmap to success, and that's what they're looking for. What can we do to be successful? If you want to have the most impact, the most immediate impact on your retention, there is a ton of things you can do. Advising must be viewed as one of the key, if not the key thing to look at. Advising gives that relationship, 
it gives that structure it allows someone to connect with that student that allows them to connect with the resources on campus please do not underestimate the impact of advising and one of the things i'd recommend you look at is is do some assessment about what the experience our students are having on advising at your institution okay final section let's go to number three in the few minutes i have left um, is around developing a retention plan uh, when, when I think about planning, uh, a lot of times people um, think and tell me, uh, you know, Gary, uh, yeah, we have a retention plan or we have a plan, but I'm not sure right where it is. Or they'll tell me that we really don't have time to do any planning. Uh, we're too busy. You know, they'll tell me a variety of things, whether it's around a strategic enrollment plan or whether it's around a retention plan or even an admissions and marketing plan. Um, one of the things I would say to you is this, is that, if you want to really change how the institution engages, use planning to help be that catalyst for that, because that's what it does. When you think about it, if you had unlimited resources, you wouldn't need to worry about planning. But to the degree that three resources, and I, by the way, I think these three resources are what we all have, the resource of technology, what technology do you have on your campus? Is it available? Does it support your retention effort? Your financial resources, what kind of budget? You know, one of the questions I ask often on campus, what kind of budget do you have for retention or student success? You, you probably already know the answer I get to that. Um, and so what financial resources you have? Or number three, what human resources do you have and how are those human resources being deployed? What planning is, is optimizing the use of those three resources to have the greatest impact. And so I'd encourage you to think about how can we use our resources to get what we want to get happen. Now, let's go to the next slide, Jennifer. You were, you were hopping to that, rightfully so. So when we look at campuses, uh, by the way, uh, uh, most campuses have an admissions and a market plan. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good one, but they have one. About two thirds, about two thirds of the campuses have a admissions or marketing plan. When we ask them about a retention plan or student success plan, typically we find about one in three have this. About 30%, 33% of those campuses have that. By the way, when we ask them if they have a strategic enrollment plan, it, it falls down to around 12%. So typically that's not the case. So a lot of times when we think about enrollment management, people think about admissions and marketing and not about retention, and they certainly don't have a plan for it. Again, most campuses have more limited resources on the retention efforts and even more necessity for a good plan. Now, let's go to the next slide, Jennifer. So as a part of your institutional plans, you have your institutional strategic plan, obviously, that says where we're going as an institution for the next five to 10 years. You have your master enrollment plan, hopefully, a strategic enrollment plan that has two arms. One is a marketing and recruitment plan, one is a retention plan. And so one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we have a retention plan that outlines what our goals are, what our strategies are, and detailed action plans. Jennifer, let's go to the next slide. So by definition, what we're trying to do is we're trying to really uh, help people through this planning process to be, again, the word clear or have clarity is the key to me. So what we wanna do is do, uh, develop this plan that really directs the efforts we're going to take. How are we going to move the needle? How are we gonna move forward? And we're going to establish for people what is their responsibility, we're going to communicate that effectively, and then we're going to start looking at the resources required, the timetables, and then importantly, how are we going to evaluate that? Jennifer, let's go to the next slide. So my encouragement in developing these plans is, first of all, if somebody says, yes, we have that plan, ask to see it. Ask them to hand it to you. I could tell you some great stories about that, but there, uh, ask them to actually see. The first thing I would encourage you to look at is find out when it was developed. Oftentimes I, I, send, I receive plans that are three, five, seven, 10, 12 years old. Probably not gonna be very effective for you. I think it needs to be a dynamic process that's continually evolving. Some key things, it needs to be results oriented. It needs to be focused on outcomes. It needs to be understood. People need to be able to communicate that. It needs to provide clarity around direction. 
it needs to be realistic. Uh, having these pie in the sky goals that aren't going to be recently uh, achieved is not going to help you poor. And it needs to adapt to changing situations. Again, the reason it should be dynamic. Uh, Jennifer, go to the next slide. It should look at um, the processes, the who, the what we're going to do, what it's going to cost, what how we're going to measure it for students as they move completely through your cycle the entire time. Um, next slide, Jennifer. I would encourage you to think about the retention planning as a part of your overall strategic efforts. You know, have those SMART goals that everyone has seen before. Know where you fall relative to national benchmarks and move yourself forward a little bit at a time. And then, and then um, Jennifer, let's go to um, uh, the next slide on 27. Uh, I would encourage you to um, uh, uh, look at these initiatives and action plans and think about it not just from oftentimes when people think about retention efforts they'll think about student success and I was in student success on campus for now when I was working uh, for almost 25 years and so I'm a big proponent of what we do in student success but I will tell you immediately if there are not strategies and actions that engage significantly academic side of our institutions, the chances of improving student success are extremely limited. Jennifer, next slide. So as a part of your planning process, and again, I would recommend that you have your retention committee do this, is start to set out what it's going to take and how we're going to do it. And again, think about it by populations, particularly by programs. And, and by the way, the other way is if students are full-time or part-time, if they are freshmen or even transfers, think about how we're going to uh, segment and differentiate some of our impact of those students by those populations programs uh, uh, that we have. And then uh, one more thing about um, this, uh, uh, having this, um, I'm not asking you to do, uh, yeah, she can go back to the next slide, uh, Jennifer. Uh, I'm not asking you to do just more activities, but really my recommendation is, is to be very results oriented. Look for uh, uh, processes and actions that actually address a problem or issue. Focus on that. If you identify that, identify what it's going to take to challenge. You're not going to be able to do it all. Establish some priorities from the very beginning. Don't just throw a bunch of things out. Say, this year we're going to work on these three or four things and we're going to focus on them. Um, look at those that are going to have the most impact. It's going, to, when we think about impact, we think about it percentages, but the way I like to think about it is how can we optimize the number of students that are going to be impacted? How do we optimize that? and then work on improving those processes and use data. Throughout the entire process, use data uh, in a significant way. Okay, next slide, Jennifer. Just very quickly on this slide, um, I would encourage you to uh, look at a couple things. One, if you develop a plan, did you actually implement what you outlined? Um, look at how it is impacting at those different stages of the process, of persistence, progression, retention, completion. And uh, did you provide surveying to students to find out how it impacted their experience on campus? And then next slide, Jennifer, please. I'd recommend that you refresh your plan on a yearly basis. Part of a great job for the retention committee is to uh, reassess the current state, refresh your goals, and establish some new structures that is needed. Very, very helpful. And then final thing on this, uh, Jennifer. These programs, retention programs, student success programs, are most impactful when they're highly structured, when there is a structure, and think about structure around providing student, uh, people on our campus with clarity. What we're trying to do is say, here's what we're going to do, here's how it's going to impact it, and then provide them that information about where we started and where we came, where we went. Two, think about how, stu how we move students through the services uh, that we provide, the programs that we provide, 
are they connected effectively to ensure that the students are successful? So I could spend all day on any one of these slides. Um, I, I hope this brief overview is helpful to you. I'm more than happy to talk to any of you. I think you'll have my contact information on this. If, if ever I can be of assistance, I'm happy to help you. But I would highly encourage you what you're doing. What you do in terms of student success has an incredible impact on our students, and that's what we're all here about. And I think with that, I'll stop. And Lauren, I think you have some comments. Terrific, thank you so much, Gary. Um, and we will take some questions for Gary um, in a moment. I am Lauren Way, and I direct the uh, program, um, our Master of Science in Higher Education Administration program here at Baypath, and our Certificate in Enrollment Management. Um, and it is my program that is sponsoring this um, webinar series. Um, on this slide, you'll see our Master of Science in Higher Education Administration gives students the option of selecting one of four concentrations in their area of interest within higher education. Um, and this includes enrollment management, general administration, institutional advancement, and online teaching and program administration. Uh, the degree is completely online uh, with no residency requirement, as is the Ruffalo Noel Levitt Certificate in Enrollment Management. Um, next slide, Jennifer, please. On this next slide, you'll see that each concentration has a total of 12 courses or 36 credits. Um, students are required to take eight core courses within their concentration and four electives, depending on their concentration. Um, the electives can be chosen from many different courses within um, higher education administration or even from graduate other graduate programs at Bay Path. Our students are encouraged to work with their faculty advisor to discuss elective options so they can customize their degree, tailoring it to their specific career interests and objectives. Uh, most students finish their degree in one to two years. In the degree program, the content is highly relevant with a focus on current issues and trends and leading edge practices in higher education. In fact, the presentation you just heard from Gary today uh, will be embedded in one of our courses. Um, we do put quite a bit of um, very cutting edge knowledge from our Ruffalo and Noel Levitz experts into our RNL courses and certificate program. We have award-winning faculty uh, who are comprised of skilled higher education administrators who have taught many years for adults online and also work um, in the field as um, college presidents, vice presidents, et cetera. And the entire curriculum prepares our students to lead, manage, and innovate in the rapidly changing field of higher education. Next slide, please. The Ruffalo No Levitt Certificate in Enrollment Management uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, Baypath has actually partnered with Ruffalo No Levitts um, for our Certificate in Enrollment Management. Uh, this six course series is Baypath University curriculum with certification from RNL. On this slide, you can see that each of the six courses in the certificate program um, address key competencies in enrollment management. And they are enrollment management principles and practices, higher education marketing and communications, financial assistance in higher education, technology applications to enrollment management, retention in higher education, and strategic planning for enrollment management, a capstone, uh, capstone course there. Um, the certificate can be taken alone, just those six courses, or it can be combined with a full degree for no additional courses. Um, there is financial aid available for um, both the certificate alone as well as the uh, full degree. Um, and we encourage you to check out our website or contact us with your questions. We'd be happy to, uh, to, to tell you more. On this next slide, I just want to highlight for a moment our brand new doctoral program. Uh, we have our inaugural class right now uh, going through this uh, wonderful curriculum. This is an entirely online co cohort-based uh, program with a few campus weekend immersion experiences that students will complete in three to four years. This is a doctoral in higher education and uh, it, students will conduct action-focused research for their dissertation and receive one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching. Um, and the deadline, we actually are currently um, having, folks are already applying for this for next year. Uh, the priority consideration deadline is April 1st, but I believe there is a bit of a rolling deadline up until next fall for our next class. Incoming class, next slide. Um, this is just information for Bay Paths University's graduate programs. This is our graduate program website. 
that I mentioned and our phone number should you um, you or your associates be interested. On this next slide, we have um, a bit about the upcoming webinars. As I mentioned, this is a um, spring webinar series that my department produces every spring. Um, and you've just heard Gary, who'll come back on the line in a moment. Um, but coming up um, at the end of February, we have uh, Brian Gower, Vice President for RNL, um, will be presenting five key trends in higher education giving. And this is um, sp specifically targeted at folks who are working on uh, fundraising and advancement um, issues. Then in April, we have amplifying digital engagement during the college search process, also led by a vice president of RNL, Stephanie Geyer. Um, and I think that's going to be a very popular webinar. And then finally, we'll conclude the spring series with our own um, provost, university provo provost, Melissa Morris Olson. She'll be presenting from her brand new published book. I haven't even gotten my hands on a copy yet. Just came out, uh, The Academic Entrepreneur, Leveraging the Campus Context to Discover and Influence New Programs. And she is a very popular speaker around the country um, on these specific issues. And I think her book will be very popular. So join us for one of these upcoming webinars. Next slide, Jen. So next we have a discussion and you are free to ask questions of Jennifer or myself with regard to the program, the curriculum or application. Um, but most likely you'll have questions for our speaker today, Gary, and he is on the line uh, in California. We are in Massachusetts. Go ahead and uh, type your questions into the, um, into the slot. We'll be able to see them, although others won't. Um, so go ahead and type in any questions uh, for, for any of us and we will read them out loud and respond. Again, the question box is in your little go-to webinar control panel, um, and you can type in any questions. It's great hey, to have thank a you. on the line. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Wei. This is Jennifer again. Um, I'll be reading out loud any questions that um, are typed in. And while people are doing that, I just wanted to uh, point out that I will be sending a copy of this presentation to all of you uh, after the session, so you can have a copy of it. You don't have to um take any notes down regarding contact information and while we're waiting for a couple more questions to be typed in i will show you gary's contact information should you wish to contact him uh later uh in the future um but you'll be getting a copy of this uh as well um this afternoon or tomorrow at the latest so let's see, um, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at what questions we have. I imagine people might be typing, but uh, keep on going. And let's see, we've got a few minutes here. Gary, I have one for you, um, a question regarding the surveys of students. Mm -hmm. um, someone would like to know, uh, are there recommended times, best times to survey uh, students? Yeah, um, uh, one of the things that we recommend oftentimes, uh, for instance, we, we have a survey called the Student Satisfaction Inventory. Uh, a lot of institutions use that survey and they might use Nessie one year, or use the Student Satisfaction Inventory another year uh, and rotate them. Uh, one of the things that I encourage uh, people to do is do it at the beginning of a semester. Uh, once you get into the semester too far, uh, I find it's, it's less effective. Uh, just students, uh, their time, uh, their attention, their focus in different places, and you're less likely to get uh, the kind of engagement that you want and the kind of cross-section uh, of engagement. Um, I think it's very important uh, to do it early on, if you can, in a semester. Uh, I think it's most helpful. Uh, secondly, in, in to ensure that you have continued good participation, I think it's very important to get back to the students with the results. Find ways to make the results known to the students. Students, people tell me all the time, students don't like to do surveys. And when I've probed students about that, literally thousands and thousands of students, what they say is they don't mind doing surveys, but they never know what happens or they don't see any indication that the information was used. So do it early on and provide that data back to the students in some way that you can, if possible. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, what key persons in an institution do you think should be included in the retention planning phase? Yeah, a, 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 a wonderful question. Uh, so who should you include? Uh, you know, obviously, um, I do think that you need to have somebody from the admission side. 
um, it's important to have someone that understands the context for what how a student is brought to the institution. I would highly encourage you to have somebody from financial aid if possible. There is no doubt that financial decisions and questions of affordability are key in students' mind. If you can get somebody, if you happen to have somebody in institutional research, or it might be in your registrar's office, I'd encourage you to bring those people uh, to, the, to the table on, on this. Um, I would encourage you to have someone from academic affairs. Uh, um, I will quite honestly say that it, it, the higher level person that you can have from academic affairs participating in this, it's essential. Because there's a lot of things that we're doing um, and I've encouraged you to do that are going to focus on improving uh, the, uh, the experience students have in the classroom or through advising and that kind of support or academic assistance. You need somebody from academic affairs. Um, and, and then, and then you, might, uh, you obviously, I would encourage you to have somebody from the student development side. Um, if you have a significant residential population, uh, a lot of times people that have responsibility around residence life is important. Um, the career centers, uh, incredibly important and significant growth in the importance of that for students now, at least that's what we're seeing. And then if you have a significant number of students in any particular programs like um, uh, music programs or theater or uh, athletics, you probably want participation there. I always encourage you to have some faculty participation because they can provide some incredibly invaluable uh, feedback in this. I typically encourage the committee to be somewhere between eight and ten people. Um, if you can get someone uh, from senior leadership, uh, your cabinet leadership team to participate in this uh, retention planning process and that committee, very, very, very valuable because they can bring that back uh, to their colleagues and their peers. And uh, a lot of times the things that we're going to need are going to need a new deployment of resources or more resources. So I'd encourage you to do that. Okay, excellent. Um, another sort of related question. This person is saying um, that she is the head of retention at her institution. However, she believes retention should be done on a campus-wide scale. However, it seems that the administration expects it to be done solely by myself and my department. Mm -hmm. How can you assist with that? Yeah, uh, tremendous question. Okay, so a lot of times institutions, uh, they uh, I characterize it, they want to check the box off that they are dealing with retention, so they create somebody that is in charge of retention. Um, uh, your job and the person's job is in doing that is really to take some of the very things that I've talked about in this presentation and to begin that process of educating the need for engagement by everyone on campus and how they can be engaged. I think it's important that we help educate people that retention is not just having one person that uh, a lot of times when I find people saying it's one person it's primarily as a almost an ombudsman they're the person that solves problems for students that's not going to move your retention in, in impact very much. What we need is the coordination of, of, of how we're using our people on campus, how we're clarifying what we're trying to do, how we are moving to have the most impact on students by in differentiated ways by who they are, what programs they're studying. And I think part of our job when we have that situation that was just described is our primary job is to help educate them. Sometimes, um, oftentimes institutions have done, uh, that's why I go to campuses by quite candidly, is to go do an assessment for them and then to provide for them an opportunity to say, okay, how do we address this as an institution? Sometimes an outside voice is helpful in that. And if something is somebody wants to talk about, I'm happy to talk with them about that process. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. 
I don't see any other questions. There could be someone typing something in. We have a couple of moments. Um, Gary, did you have any other words of wisdom you'd like to share while we're waiting? <laughs> I don't know any words of wisdom. I will tell you a very, very quickly. I know we have two minutes. Okay, and I started my career very young. I uh, finished my master's degree very young, and I had been in the field for three years, just been the assistant dean at Tulane University, and I was all of, I think, 23 years old. <laughs> Um, I had, uh, had, had, had been lucky and, and successful in advancing in my career pretty fast. And it was funny, I, um, I was deciding of whether I wanted to stay in higher education or leave. I had the opportunity and actually uh, came, lived in Florida growing up, uh, and I applied to be a trainer at Disney University, you know, which they actually have a Disney University and a trainer, and I got the job. I realized that day uh, that I got the job, I was gonna have to make a decision and I was gonna have to come in and tell my dean at the time, vice president, uh, that he took this chance on this 23 year old as his assistant dean and now I was leaving to go work at Disney World. Uh, not something I was really looking forward to, to be honest with you. Um, but that day, by happenstance, uh, we had an in-service training in, at, there at Tulane and we had a speaker, and this was before there was an Noel Levitz, before, we, before there was an RNL or Ruffalo Cody. And we had a speaker come in and talk about student success, talk about retention. It was something that had been uh, 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 just beginning to really be talked about in any significant ways. Um, the speaker asked a very interesting question. He asked the question, what have you done today to affect the quality of a student's experience at your campus. What have you done today? And the whole idea was what we do makes a difference in the experience students have and their chances of being successful. I stayed, I turned down Disney World and I stayed in higher education because of that presentation, because of that question. And now 43 years later, I look back and I go, that question is even more important today with the pressure students have. By the way, just as happenstance, the person that was doing that presentation was Lee Knoll, the founder of our company. Wow. Um, and he was asking that before anybody was asking that question. And he was working for ACT at the time and was around the country talking and trying to encourage people to think about not just getting students in, but what we do to help them be successful. I stayed in the field because of that, that presentation on that particular day. So it, it means a lot what you do, and I give you all the encouragement I can to, to keep moving forward with it. Great, um, thank you so much. Dr. Wei, go ahead. Um, we have just a couple more minutes, or one more minute, actually. Yes, we are wrapping up, but I just wanted to double check that the handout that I can see on my screen in this control panel is available to others on the on the line. It's the 35 Good Practices and Retention Survey that um, Gary uh, often presents on, and when he does, I know it's wildly popular. I've heard this is one of his most popular um, presentations, but we knew we wouldn't have time in, in, in today's presentation. Is that handout that I can see, is it downloadable by um, everyone who's a participant? on the line it should be uh lauren i if someone could um just type in yes they can access it that would be really helpful to us um it's oh done someone says received yes yep otherwise i think you could send it out um yeah. there is permission to send it out to uh, those totally. of those of you who logged in which i think is a, is a, is a fantastic tool i'm gonna um check that out myself Yep, I will, I'll send it out with the PDF um, of the slideshow. So, great. Uh, thank thanks. you so much. Good. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for allowing me to speak. This has been a great experience, and I, I can't encourage everybody enough. So, yes, and on behalf of everyone at Bay Path and um, at uh, Gary of RNL, we thank you so much for joining us today. You're we're welcome. so pleased you were with us, that you participated, asked great questions. Um, and we hope to see you back with us on future um, upcoming Hot Topics webinars. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.